Hello, and a very warm welcome to LMT YouTube channel. Charles Ponzi is often referred to as one of the greatest crooks of all time. He is considered the father of the pyramid scheme, often applied in disguised capital mobilization forms as today. In his infamous life, Ponzi started his business with $2.5 in his pocket. 17 years later, he became a millionaire with $15 million, or about $348 million today. In the end, when he died he had only $75, enough to pay for burial expenses. In today's video, we will learn about Charles Ponzi, the grandfather of the STAM model, has been raging the world for 100 years. Aspiration to change life Born on March 3, 1882, in the village of Carlo Ponzi, in the town of Lugo, province of Emilia, Romagna, Italy, the Ponzi Chales never lived in a poor family. However, he started his career as a postman to help support his family. After graduating from high school, Ponzi entered the University of Rome La Sapienza. However, this period did not last long because Ponzi and some close friends considered this to be four years of vacation. This reason, coupled with the lack of tuition, quickly brought Ponzi out of the university lecture hall. After being expelled, Ponzi decided to come to the U.S. to look for a chance. In 1903, with the encouragement of his father, Ponzi boarded a train to Boston, Massachusetts, USA, when there was only 2.5 USD in his pocket. After coming to the United States, he started studying English and wandered from city to city, doing all kinds of jobs such as washing dishes and waiters to make a living. In 1907, after being fired for frequent overpayments of customers and petty theft, Ponzi went to Montreal, Canada and became a customer support staff at Banco Zorosi. This is a newly opened bank of boss Luigi Zorosi. Banco Zorosi primarily caters to the Italian immigrant community here. Because the deposit interest rate from customers is up to 6%, double that of other banks. Banco Zorosi has grown very fast after its opening. But there is no way that a private bank could raise capital at such interest rates if it was just normal business. Ponzi has learned how to take money from the latter to pay to the previous person from the teacher Zarasi. To be fair, Zarasi invented this pyramid model. However, it was Ponzi who applied it most successfully and reminded many generations to come. Shortly after that, Ponzi realized that Banco Zorasi was on the verge of bankruptcy due to bad debts, because most customers borrowed short-term money to invest in real estate. Besides, interest payments to customers are not from investment activities, but are drawn from deposits in newly opened accounts. Shortly after the opening, Banco Zorosi defaulted, and the older Zorosi fled to Mexico. While the tall Zorosi ran far away, Ponzi stayed behind and also went back to America to find a livelihood. Once wandering to his old workplace, Ponzi stumbled upon a blank check and realized that this was an opportunity to buy tickets to the United States. He rewarded himself with $423.58 and forged the signature of his former boss Zorosi on a check. The Montreal police quickly caught Ponzi when he was using the fake check to pay for a pile of newly purchased goods. Ponzi spent three years in a prison in Quebec for this charge. While in prison, he wrote to his family in Italy, saying that he is currently working as a special assistant for a prison custodian in Canada. In 1911, after getting out of Quebec prison, Ponzi decided to return to the United States. However, the United States welcomed Ponzi with a two-year prison term in Atlanta on charges of organizing illegal immigration for Italians. After going to jail, 
He became an Italian translator for a prison official here. This person is tasked with censoring letters in Italian language to the notorious bandit general Ignazio Lupo serving a sentence in this prison. After some time, Hanzi was released earlier because he persuaded the prison doctor to believe he was poisoned by eating shaving soap. The Story from the Stamps After being released from prison, Hanzi returned to Boston because this is the place he has been familiar with since he came to America. Hanzi became acquainted with Rose Necco, a beautiful Italian girl. The Rose family, after knowing her love story, was fiercely prevented and told Rose about the identity of the person she was passionate about. However, Rose defied it all and married Ponzi in 1918. After marrying Rose, Ponzi went to work for a private company, and he was thinking of creating various types of advertising related to the postal sector, which can be sold to many different companies. This is the idea that the U.S. Postal Corporation later created a Yellow Pages telephone book to sell ads to customers. However, when Ponzi's idea was not realized, the company went bankrupt. In August 1919, during the unemployment period, Ponzi sought to export an American magazine. He then wrote a letter to a nobleman in Spain about his business intentions and asked him to collaborate. The Spanish nobleman wrote a letter in response to the Ponzi, which included an IRC coupon attached to international postage. Amazed at the first IRC vote he saw, Ponzi has studied and researched all things related to this vote, as well as regulations on postage stamps, U.S. and international postal systems. After many days of searching, Ponzi discovered that, at that time, many countries had used IRC. This coupon was worth as a free stamp that the recipient would use it to write a reply to. Sender IRC vouchers are sold in different countries at different rates imposed by the postal industry. As a result, there will be large amounts of money if buying IRC in a country with a low price and bringing it to stamps for sale in countries with higher postage rates. With the gift of IRC, Ponzi changed it into a stamp for sale and found that, in the U.S., each IRC can be sold for six cents, six times higher than the purchase price of one IRC voucher in the Spain. Great Business Idea After World War I, the serious inflation situation in Italy made the postage much lower than in the U.S., so IRC vouchers bought very cheaply in Italy will be changed to postage stamps in the U.S. and collected. Watch profit because it is sold at a higher price. According to Ponzi's calculation, an IRC plate if purchased in Italy and brought back to the U.S. after deducting all costs, will get a profit of 400% times. On November 26, 1919, Ponzi established a securities trading company to carry out his IRC business plan, which people still referred to as Ponzi Scheme decades later. Under this plan, Ponzi pledged to start paying interest of 50% of the capital. They invested after 45 days and pay 100% interest within 90 days. Believing in this new and soundly sound business project of Ponzi, the American people started to invest in Ponzi's company. Day every day, thousands line up in front of Ponzi's office on School Street, waiting for their turn to pay Ponzi's investment money and receive bonds issued by his company valued at between $10 and up $50 USD in order to raise more money from customers. Ponzi opened many agents with huge commissions. By February 1920, Ponzi had raised about US dollar 5, 0, then US dollar 30,000 and reached US dollar 420,000 in May 1920. By then, Ponzi had invested a large part of this amount in the Hanover Trust Bank with the participation of hopefully he will become the chairman of the board of directors of this bank 
when he has the necessary capital. By June 1920, according to the Boston Post, Ponzi raised about US$250,000 a day, the capital that Ponzi had raised was millions. On peak days, Ponzi's employees cannot work to collect money, and Ponzi's boss always has rows of bonds in his pocket to sell to customers every time he goes out to the city. In the first few dozen days, some customers did not receive the promised interest. However, people still poured more money, even though many people pledged their homes to bring money to Ponzi. By this time, Charles Ponzi had been hailed as a hero of the Italian community in America. While at the peak of its success, Ponzi has offices from Maine to New Jersey. He also has a 12-room mansion in Lexington, several cars including a custom-built limousine, and many diamonds and jewelry for his wife. He builds trust for his clients by his elegant appearance. He is always busy at work and often has to go to partners or important customers. You are watching videos on LMT channel. Do not forget to visit the new channel of the group of videos about the royal family. Details see below the comment. The empire began to wobble. In June 1920, financial expert Clarence Barron explored, investigated, and concluded that Ponzi had almost no investment in customer deposits in IRC trading. The capital Ponzi has raised about 15 million USD. He should have bought about 160 million IRC votes to do business as the project. However, Ponzi only bought around 27,000 IRC votes. Subsequently, the U.S. Postal Service introduced a new regulation that IRC coupons were not traded in large numbers in the United States or brought in outside. In fact, IRC votes are still being sent into the United States in huge numbers through personal means. Before that, it was not without suspicion that Ponzi's business was stirring up America because people could not understand which path a man with little education went to jail committed and did not commit. Pockets like Ponzi became a millionaire in a moment. However, all investigations, including those from the press, were haunted by Ponzi using money to hide the truth. At that time, it was reported that Ponzi was still having an additional investment project of about 300 million USD to buy a large US warship. After acquiring this battleship, Ponzi will call for capital from investors to repair and upgrade for business, turning the battleship into a unique commercial and entertainment area in the United States. On June 26, 1920, the Ponzi empire began to wobble as countless customers did not receive interest as promised by Ponzi. Thousands of people gathered around the office of Ponzi's securities trading company to collect debts. Right on the first day, the owner Ponzi had to pay full interest for about 1,000 customers and paid about 2 million USD interest for customers in three consecutive days. At the same time, Ponzi also made reassuring announcements that the company had just encountered an organizational problem and could not pay customers' interest. These moves of Ponzi had won many customers, fewer people opposed Ponzi, and he was applauded again. Ponzi even announced that he was completing the procedure of opening Charles Ponzi Company to invest in a number of industries around the world. Money continued to flow into Ponzi's company, eating many of Ponzi's customers, after receiving enough interest, paid in the money they just received to invest in Ponzi's plan. The truth is exposed. This peaceful situation did not last long as customers came to collect debts every day. Ponzi had to hire James McMaster, a very good public relations officer to reassure customers before this terrible storm. However, after studying the business and financial situation of a securities trading company, McMaster turned away from Ponzi, declaring in the Boston Post that Ponzi was the ignorant financier 
and provided Grampus Flyer all internal information of the Ponzi scheme. It was later reported that the Boston Post had to pay $5,000 to McMaster in exchange for the above information. On August 2, 1920, the Boston Post made a headline on the front page about the state of the stock trading company collapsing. Boston Post made a sensational revelation that the financial witch, Chales Ponzi, was actually a former prisoner who had forged checks and even trafficked people from Italy to Canada. On August 10, 1920, federal police raided the company's office, but found only a small number of IRC votes there. The customers who were at Ponzi's company at the time were scrambling with the police. They do not want to see their debtor in jail to escape debt. On August 13, 1920, Ponzi was arrested. He is accused of committing 86 counts of fraud. According to public sources, up to 40,000 people have invested about US$15 million in the Ponzi scheme. The Hanover Trust Bank was closed shortly thereafter. After Ponzi was arrested, people understood the very sophisticated method of fraud, but came from a very simple principle of him to pay for the money of the latter to give to the people first. According to Ponzi, not many people aren't dazzled by the money before their eyes. Therefore, the customer, the second victim, will be blinded when they see the large amount of interest that the first person has received so easily without knowing that this is their own money. Next are the third, fourth people. This method of fraud has been rife throughout the world since the time of Ponzi. Follow the trail of the fallen vehicle. After Charles Ponzi was arrested, his total assets were only about 1.6 million USD, which is nowhere near the huge amount that Ponzi owes to customers. It was not until Ponzi was arrested that people only knew he had only 45 USD of legal income from the interest of five shares in a phone company. After that, Ponzi only paid about 5 million USD for all clients. On December 1, 1920, Ponzi was sentenced to five years in prison for fraud. However, he was released from prison three and a half years later. Shortly after being released from prison, Ponzi was sentenced to an additional nine years by a Massachusetts court on similar charges. However, Ponzi has paid $14,000 in bail for 30 days. During this time, Ponzi had flown to Florida to devise a new fraud scheme on real estate sales similar to the previous Ponzi scheme. Ponzi claims to have bought an acre, about four, zero square meters, out of pocket and is dividing the land into 23 lots and for sale. He convinced customers that each plot of land will cost 5.3 million USD after two years of investment. In June 1926, the Florida government discovered this Ponzi scheme. He fled to Texas, but was later arrested at the port of New Orleans and sent to prison. During this time, people tried to find every way to find out the money that Ponzi had appropriated from customers in the Ponzi scheme in 1920, but got no results. On October 7, 1934, Ponzi was released. When Ponzi stepped out of the prison gate, there was a crowd of old creditors waiting for him. Shortly afterwards, Ponzi was deported to Italy because he did not have American citizenship. His wife Rose remained in Boston and divorced from Ponzi afterwards. The two remained corresponded until his death. After returning to Rome, Ponzi worked as an English translator. Italian dictator Benito Mussolini did not understand why he used Ponzi, making him an important position in the Italian National Airline, 1939-1942. After working here for a while, Ponzi quickly discovered that some airline officials were using planes to smuggle foreign currencies. Ponzi offered to join the group, but was flatly rejected. Immediately, 
Hanzi revenge by reporting to all Mussolini authorities for arrest. However, World War II broke out. Hanzi quickly fell into unemployment and wandered to find work like the first days to America. In January 1949, Charles Hanzi died at the hospital. Before retiring from life, the once millionaire tried to save $1.75 to cover the cost of a funeral and leave a fraudulent method called Ponzi scheme. Ponzi is considered to be a famous speculator because he has used his own life to prove to other speculators that there is no law of the state that cannot be avoided, nor is it reason cannot but be put to sleep. After his death, this form is still applied and transformed in many parts of the world. It is even more sophisticated than the way that Ponzi once did scams billions of millions of victims thanks for watching the video at lnt don't forget to click the subscribe button and watch more new videos to support the group don't stop.